So Mark Jackson, should we should we get going or yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Go, go, go ahead. Um, okay. Well, um, I think I agreed to kick it off and uh, but we'll start first with um, with introductions. Uh, so uh, my name is Nathan Baker. I'm from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and University of Washington. Um, my background is not necessarily in quantum computing. Uh, my work for a long time has been sort of at the intersection of um, uh, physical chemistry and biophysics and uh, applied mathematics. Um, but I've been really excited about the opportunities that uh, quantum information sciences more broadly can have for the, the Northwest. And so I've been working closely with, uh, with UW and with Microsoft to, to try to get the NQN uh, launched. Kaime? Thanks, I'm Kaime Fu. I'm a professor at the University of Washington uh, working in the physics department and the electrical and computer engineering department. And I have a dual appointment at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I've been uh, working uh, in quantum information experimental work uh, throughout my career and my research focus is on uh, crystal defects to uh, store quantum information and to couple information to, to light. Hey, Mark? My, name, yep, my name is Mark Sang. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft in academic and scientific partnerships. So I mostly focus on um, curriculum workforce development at uh, universities and scientific institutions. I also work on um, some grant and funding opportunities at centers, coalitions, um, and things of that nature. Great, okay. So um, Mark, if you can advance the slides. Awesome. So uh, I'm gonna, the, the structure of this talk is, is we'll say a little bit about what the Northwest Quantum Nexus is. I'm gonna go through those first few slides. Uh, what our goals are, what we've been doing, uh, what, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Um, then we'll go through uh, a series of, of vignettes or overviews um, for each of the three partners about the research and the activities going on at those partners. And then uh, to wrap things up, we'll cover um, some of what's coming up with the Northwest Quantum Nexus, as well as uh, ways that you can get involved. So um, the idea of the Northwest Quantum Nexus, uh, to be completely frank, was to make sure that the Northwest was getting the credit it deserved for, for not only the ongoing activities in quantum information sciences, but also um, the huge potential if partners in the Northwest can work together to advance uh, the quantum information sciences ecosystem. Um, so the, we use a metaphor that you'll see in a, a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of the full stack and the full stack is probably easiest uh, uh, to describe in the context of computing. Um, but really the Northwest Quantum Nexus is embracing all aspects of, of quantum information sciences. So the way it started was uh, with three keystone partners, um, Microsoft, PNNL, and UW had a set of uh, existing uh, strong relationships and as also a set of mutual interests in advancing uh, quantum information sciences in the Northwest, uh, both from you know scientific accomplishments, but also as you'll see in some of the subsequent slides in terms of the ecosystem, the workforce that we train and attract to the Northwest. So really in, in all aspects of quantum information sciences. So we say Keystone Partners, those are the founding partners, but the goal of the Northwest Quantum Nexus is to make this an inclusive uh, environment, um, really showing the, the diversity and the depth of activity in quantum information sciences in the Northwest. And, um, you know, uh, Mark and Kaime, feel free to, to jump in at any point. Um, if you don't have any additional comments, then I'll ask Mark to switch to the next slide. Okay, so what are we trying to do? Um, first and foremost, we wanna capitalize on the potential between uh, the, the potential that underlies public-private partnerships. Um, and maybe it's best to start with this map over here on the, uh, on the um, left of the slide. So when we think about uh, the Northwest, we're, we're taking a very broad view of the Northwest. We're, we're willing to include some Northern Californian uh, folks, but we're really thinking of the, of the Cascadia Corridor as, as you probably heard it described, as well as partners over in uh, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, um, but with the, the sort of nucleus being in Oregon, Washington State, and British Columbia. 
And so we're really excited about the opportunity to present to this group because it's a chance to hopefully build participation uh, from Oregon as well. Um, so first and foremost, as I mentioned, we're capitalizing on the different strengths and the different uh, capabilities that, that come when uh, different organizations from uh, the public sector, such as state universities and uh, national labs, Department of Energy National Labs, as well as private organizations like Microsoft, um, what they can bring together that they uh, can't necessarily do independently. And so um, that's a series of activities that I'll talk more about in subsequent slides, but it's also a series of goals. And the first of the goals is building a competitive quantum workforce. And the recognition, with, with all due respect to Kaime and her physics background, the recognition is that the quantum workforce is not just going to be driven by physicists. It's a huge diversity of skill sets, but diversity both in terms of disciplines that we'll need to draw people from, as well as education levels and the way different ways in which they'll be able to engage in the quantum ecosystem. So it's, it's going to be a real, uh, I think a real push. Uh, we're already feeling the strain in our hiring, trying to get all of the different skill sets needed um, to, to have a functioning workforce at the lab or in the Northwest. So that's, that's one of the goals of the Northwest Quantum Nexus. A second goal is to make sure that as we grow and train and recruit that workforce, that they have something to do. And so um, working with uh, state governments and with local organizations, as well as, as companies and, and uh, federal institutions, we want to work to develop the regional ecosystem. And the region, regional ecosystem in quantum information sciences is already excellent. I mean, that was one of the original things we wanted to accomplish with the Northwest Quantum Nexus is make sure that people knew, you know, great, you can look at the Maryland area, you can look at the Northeast, you can look at Chicago, and they all have a lot of great activities in, in the Bay Area as well. But there is a tremendous amount of potential here in the Northwest with two of the world's largest tech companies, with first-class research um, institutions. It's just a real, uh, I think, goldmine uh, for, for building up this kind of ecosystem. So when we say ecosystem, certainly it includes those types of existing um, uh, companies that are either getting into or have been in quantum for quite some time. But it also includes uh, startups and making sure that it's possible that uh, you know, research organizations can spin off quantum enabled uh, capabilities, incubate them and grow new opportunities in the Northwest. And last, but certainly not least, it's um, the Northwest Quantum Nexus wants to foster and pioneer multidisciplinary research. Uh, the currency for a lot of our interactions, especially the interactions between the Keystone partners that got this started, we're all based on research. And there are so many open questions in quantum information science and so many challenges that need to be addressed. And again, it's not something that can necessarily be addressed by one discipline or one institution. It's something where bringing together different institutions with different capabilities, pulling on different disciplines, really offers the possibility to, to, to make progress in some of these challenges. So again, that's why we were um, pushing for, the, you know, and, and, and came up with the Northwest Quantum Nexus. Uh, Mark, uh, unless you or Kai may have uh, anything to add, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so why the Northwest? Um, this is a, a series of uh, figures I pulled out of uh, an issue of Nature in 2019, which showed, um, you know, I maybe don't like the, the complete equivalency of cash for qubits, but, but basically shows the types of um, investments and the magnitude of investments in, in different parts of the world. And, um, if you take the Northwest and you include our, our Northern Californian colleagues, there's a tremendously outsized uh, impact and investment on the West Coast. And a huge amount of that, that investment sits in British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. So there really is, um, and this, this plot, if, you, if you're focused on the left-hand side, um, uh, shift your attention to the lower right-hand side of the slide, and you'll see the global map. And it really is amazing the, the depth of investment and the depth of capability that exists in the Northwest. So when we first started talking about, um, you know, making sure that we got our equal due when people were talking about Chicago or the Northeast or what have you, people would say, well, why the Northwest? And uh, I think nature said it best with some of these, uh, these figures and, and that describe the, the capabilities up here in the region. Um, so same deal, Mark, uh, Kaime, if you wanna add anything, uh, great. Otherwise we'll go on to the next slide. 
Okay, so I mentioned this full stack um, approach and I mentioned sort of the research directions that, that um, span the full stack. Uh, this is a very quantum computing centric slide, um, but I think it's, it's important to realize as I'm sure the audience does, that there are challenges in all areas of quantum information sciences and many uh, progress in many of those areas are complementary. So it's, it's not that, by foc that, that the NQN is solely focused on quantum computing and that's not what this, this slide is meant to convey. What it is meant to convey though, is that whether you think about it in terms of problems like sensing or you think about it in terms of problems like computing, um, there is, or networking, there is a set of challenges that have to be addressed. And none of those challenges stand on their own. So the areas in which the Northwest Quantum Nexus uh, research activities are currently focused are focused on the two ends of that stack. Down at the bottom of the stack, you have the material science problems that get transformed into devices that make any sort of quantum information sciences possible. And there's some deep research challenges down there about atomic precision, about atomic purity, about making devices from, from robust materials and finding out the best way to operate those through control problems um, that are sort of fundamental and represent one end of the stack that, that our research partnerships are exploring. At the other end of the stack though, there's, there's the question of how do you use these powerful quantum capabilities? What do you do with them? And um, that's certainly the space of, of applications, thinking about where they could be used to solve problems in physical sciences, a lot of the work between Microsoft and PNNL is focused on thinking about problems in computational chemistry, but there's certainly many, many other areas of fundamental science and applied sciences where the power um, offered by a quantum computer can help crack some of those uh, exponentially growing problems that appear in material science and chemistry in different types of nuclear physics and particle physics problems. But those applications, even once you've identified them and you think you've identified the algorithms and the way you're gonna represent the problem, they aren't meaningful if you don't have a way to actually implement them. So another large effort going on within NQN is understanding the programming languages, the algorithms, the way to do software development in a, in a quantum uh, type of ecosystem. So we're very focused at the two ends of the stack. Um, and in some sense, we're looking at the, uh, the technologies that would support any given quantum architecture that would uh, appear in the middle in uh, say the test bed section. I'll pause for a bit if, if Mark and Kai may have anything to add, otherwise we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so, so what have we been up to? Um, back in March uh, 2019, which feels like many, many lifetimes ago, um, several hundred of us <laughs> got together, which feels very strange, um, and, and held uh, sort of an inaugural event, the Northwest Quantum uh, Nexus Summit. Uh, it, it, we were hoping to make this a biannual event. Um, we'll see what uh, COVID permits. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, in addition to launching the Northwest Quantum Nexus, you see here on stage, Senator Cantwell and uh, Brad Smith, um, we, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we kind of kicked it off with a bang, that there was attention and visibility paid, and then that we followed up with a series of activities. And um, some of these activities have been a little bit stymied uh, by COVID like, like many things, um, but we have an ongoing uh, virtual seminar series, uh, which we sort of uh, resulted to when many of our, our workshops and other activities were canceled. We've turned that into a virtual format that's ongoing. Uh, Kai May gave the inaugural talk um, uh, last month. Uh, in the next week or so, we have another talk by Nathan Weeb. Uh, from formerly of Microsoft and uh, currently at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, and then in the upcoming months, we're planning to cycle through both intramural and extramural speakers. We're always looking for speaker ideas. And so uh, we'd be very interested in hearing from you, either if you're interested in listening in, uh, we'll, this is a public event, we make the link available, or if you have ideas on people who might be good speakers for the series. So in addition to that ongoing seminar series, we've had also um, several workshops uh, focusing on different themes that fit with uh, either the research agenda that I mentioned or regional interests by members of the quantum, uh, the Northwest Quantum Nexus members. So uh, quantum programming, uh, this, this, this first workshop not only focused on the, the, the research challenge in the stack, um, as, but it also talked about its practical implications in terms of workforce development and education. The second one focused on a particular problem of 
of uh, quantum phases and matter with uh, cold atoms and it reflected uh, expertise around the region, but also interests in regional, regional capabilities uh, for having um, basically laboratories that would be dedicated to being able to sense and simulate with cold atoms. There's a workshop led by Kai Mei on quantum transduction, as she mentioned, moving quantum information between different forms. And then there was also a more commerce focused uh, activity in a breakout session during the uh, Cascadia Innovation Corridor Conference. Um, so I'll pause there. And I think that might be the last slide of introduction and we're gonna move over to um, some of the, the research summaries. Um, so Kaime or Mark, if you, have, if you don't have anything to add, we can probably move on to the next slide. That was great, Nathan, thanks. Yep, thanks, Nathan. Okay, so I will jump off and, and start us off with the um, QIS research at Microsoft. So let me start with a statement regarding uh, Microsoft's quantum mission. So at Microsoft, our corporate mission is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. So with that in mind, um, our quantum uh, mission is focused on solving the world's most complex challenges by developing the most scalable and impactful quantum system. We need a quantum computer that can scale to solve difficult and useful problems while driving impact. So this is the type of problem um, that the world's classical intractable um, problems can't be solved, um, but can be with a quantum computer. So here we have an RSA uh, 2048 challenge. And what this is, is basically a 2048 bit number um, you have to identify the two prime numbers that are multiplied together to obtain um, that number. And so this challenge uh, really focuses on uh, RSA cryptography, which has uh, implications in inter internet commerce. Um, but essentially a classical computer would take about a billion years to solve. So Peter Shore developed a, uh, an algorithm in 1994 where he could solve this problem in a hundred seconds uh, in a quantum computer. So quite a significant speed up um, using a quantum computer. So what are the areas where the ability to solve classical intractable problems could help? Um, there are three areas uh, you should care about sort of in quantum computing um, that will be significantly disruptive. And that's um, cryptography, the simulation of quantum systems and optimization. So solutions to problems in these areas will help address the energy crisis, um, climate change, food scarcity, and uh, personal and pre precision um, medical diagnostics. But to deliver a full promise of quantum computing, we need a quantum computer that can scale. A quantum computer that can grow um, to a thousand, thousands of qubits and beyond and that can run months at a time and uh, reliably return results. There's a lot of conversation focused on devices, on the number of qubits, but to scale, we need to scale everything, not just the qubit. This is where uh, Microsoft's full stack approach to quantum computing comes in. Uh, unlocking solutions to the world's most challenging problems will require a truly scalable quantum system, one where both hardware and software can handle tens of thousands of qubits and beyond. Achieving the scale will require a worldwide community innovating together across every layer of the quantum stack, from hardware up to their control and readouts and up through software and applications. As an example, we shared an innovative innovation coming out of our Microsoft Quantum Sydney lab at Ignite last November, whereby we figured out how to control 50,000 qubits with just three wires. This breakthrough was an impressive challenge which involved extreme engineering. The conventional method controls less than 100 qubits and it takes hundreds of coaxial cables. As you can see, we're not only committed to, but it's critical that we involve, that we innovate across the whole stack. But speaking to the first bullet at the very top there, 
we also need to empower our community to collaborate with us. We've always said that the quantum uh, computing is not something Microsoft will come up with alone. And so it takes you know, the best and brightest across the world. And that's including the best and brightest people, facilities, uh, community, thinking about innovating at each uh, layer of the stack. So to collect these, the best and the brightest uh, the world has to offer, we've necessarily located our pro quantum program across the world. Uh, and the reality is the quantum is, is a global effort. So to give you visibility um, to how Microsoft Quantum Program is dispersed, uh, I invite you to take a look at the URL down below there when you have time. But in essence, um, the Quantum Program is di dispersed across eight sites around the world. I've had the pleasure of working with some notable scientists, researchers, engineers, and fabricators across all of them, including Charlie Marcus in Copenhagen, Peter Kruckstrup in Lingby, Leo Cohenhaven in Delft, Mike Manfra in Purdue, Chaitan Nayak and Roman Luchin in SB, UCSB, and then Krista Savori and, and Matthias Troyer in Redmond. But our labs reflect our full stack approach and funnel talent into Redmond-based Microsoft quantum program around the world. So let me switch gears a little bit and talk uh, about quantum around the world. Uh, from countries that our labs are situated in. I guess thematically, one of the things that runs across the globe is that we all can't do it alone. And um, it's going to be done very purposefully through coordination and synergies, unlocking across you know, both public and private entities. So that includes you know, professors, students, and industrial partners, government, government labs, and industrial partners, and then of course, science, government, and industry. But across all of these variations, it's, it's clear that public and private thread is a very strong and consistent theme. So here are some numbers um, that underline the public and, and private efforts of funding around the globe. Um, and this is captured um, across publicly available articles. Uh, the picture of this, uh, this slide paints is that it's clearly impressive of how much money is being spent across government, schools, and companies and startups. The global QC market in 2019 was pegged for $88 billion in size and compound annual growth of 29%. And that's over 2019 through 2026. So the, the real purpose of this slide though is, is not to you know, strike competitive fear in the hearts, uh, but to underscore the the quantum revolution is real and it's happening and being invested across the world. I think there's a real opportunity here in the United States, the Pacific Northwest, um, to be leaders and stewards in this, in this endeavor. Okay, I wanna really uh, touch on briefly the, the NQI Act in, in the United States. Um, our former CVP of quantum testified with the US Senate on a hearing on quantum technology in the fall of 2018. So on the heels of that, uh, the NQI Act was signed into being by Congress. The NQI addressed many of the uh, appeals uh, we made, um, three of which. Um, the first one is investing in quantum uh, workforce. So that's all variants of the workforce, including programmers, material science, fabricators, uh, cryogenics, and algorithm designers. The second is investing in scalable quantum computing technology. Uh, so the need to increase scale and quality of uh, quantum hardware. Uh, Microsoft has its own approach and others have different approaches. Uh, the key to unlocking quantum is the reliability, scalability of the qubits. Third and final is the, the support uh, to development of quantum algorithms today. So that's DOE test beds, as Nathan mentioned, um, encouraging strong and new partnerships across government, um, academia, and industry. Uh, so, for example, PNNL and Microsoft uh, partner around Northwest Chem to drive development of novel quantum algorithms and software tools for studying and understanding um, the most challenging problems in quantum chemistry. 
There's of course regional centers um, bringing together um, UW, PNNL, and Microsoft in response to the NQI Act. And we are also pleased to see you know, some combination of Microsoft, University of Washington, and or PNNL ended up in the um, four of the five funded NQI centers, um, which helps enable opportunities across pollination across, across these different centers. Okay, so, so what are we doing uh, for the workforce of tomorrow and the workforce today? The workforce today, um, for the workforce of today, uh, he, here's a distribution of, of what degrees and years of work experience that our Microsoft FTEs tend to come with. Um, clearly, you'll see a, a opportunity for growth in the, the one to five year bar. Um, and that's essentially enabling, you know, fresh graduates to join without going through PhDs and uh, academia first. So, so how are we engaging um, this whole academic ecosystem right now? So locally, uh, Microsoft has contributed uh, directly to a teaching course. So in early 2019, Krista Savore uh, led a 10 week undergraduate four credit course teaching quantum computing and quantum um, programming to the computer science department at the University of Washington. Um, by all accounts, the, the course was very successful and we're discussing uh, repeating it as well. In recognition of the, the pent up demand for the undergraduate curriculum content, um, programming homework, tools like the teaching harness, and opportunity to distribute freely our Q Sharp and QTK assets, we've gone around the world to um, bring curriculum to other universities in countries as far as India, Africa, South America, and Israel. Most recently, though, um, Maria Miklova, uh, who's a member of the systems team, taught a master's level course at the Northeastern University uh, Seattle campus, and that was just earlier this year. So we'll continue to update our curriculum and look forward to opportunities to distribute this. Um, a couple other tools we, we um, are using, um, internships. So Microsoft has one of the largest quantum internship programs globally. Um, as with triplet programs, the downside of in internships, however, is that it can only be experienced by a few. So this leads us um, to a need to invest in more broadly adoptable, sometimes self-serving uh, tools such as katas. And if, if you've never heard of the, the term kata before, a, a kata is a, a system of individual training exercises uh, for practitioners of karate and other martial arts. Um, so a kata is also in a, a way that um, on a bite-sized basis, one can learn uh, by doing, get immediate feedback, um, and increase um, uh, complexity as you go. So we've created the Quantum Katas project and that's been going on for over a year now um, with 20 Katas and eight different tutorials um, uh, for, for learners to look at. The Katas are all open source and freely available um, uh, to anyone. And there's a, there's a link on the bottom right there if you're interested. Okay, here this is um, to, to further underscore really the, the quantum impact now in, in the arena. Um, here, here's a, it's a slightly uh, out of date um, job postings for, for Microsoft, but really what we wanna illustrate here is the breadth of the, the role act, uh, of roles actively being hired for in quantum. So you can see quantum jobs are here and they are real. So to, to continue with the theme of uh, quantum impact today, uh, at the Microsoft Build event, we announced uh, that Quan Azure Quantum um, ecosystem that we originally shared news about in November 2019 at Ignite is now rolling out and moving to limited preview. And so the shorthand of this is that Azure Quantum is, is a way to start experiencing and, and building quantum solutions today using pre-built solutions that run on classical computers. So for example, quantum inspired solutions. For our customers and partners, Azure Quantum represents the first open cloud ecosystem 
to bring together a diverse set of quantum solutions, software, and hardware. So we just uh, discussed earlier um, in terms of layers of stack, Azure Quantum um, brings together all layers of the stack. So hardware, open source, uh, software tools, services um, to empower a growing community of over 200,000 quantum developers pursuing solutions to critical and useful application areas. So we're pleased that the ecosystem includes partners like OneQubit, Honeywell, IonQ, and QCI seated at various levels of the stack in order that we can create and offer diversity. Um, the diversity in hardware allows you to write lasting code or build algorithms that run and scale different um, against a, a wide variety of, of hardware, um, whether classical or quantum. And the familiar, trusted, um, scalable, and secure environment that is Azure will help developers ramp quickly on having impact now building for the future. So what if, what if you're not a student, um, but you're, you're uh, a member of industry or developer at a company? Well, quantum impact uh, today means bring, being able to use what's available uh, of quantum today to solve real problems. So a Azure Quantum can allow you to participate in quantum impact today. Okay, so, so how can we get started? Um, the thing I want to pull your attention to is the lower right uh, URL, azure.com backslash quantum. You can get all the information there on uh, how to um, gain access, um, to request access, um, to use the MS Learn modules. Um, another way to look at is to um, watch the Azure Quantum Developer Workshop. That was um, a couple, a month ago. Um, it's on demand now. You can watch that. Um, I also can would like to um, shout out to the IEEE Quantum Week that is happening this week. Um, Microsoft will be there with a workshop and tutorial and panel. Um, so that's happening Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, respectively. Um, but yeah, thank you uh, so much for your time. And, and that's all I had. Um, I'll turn it over to Kai Mei next. Great, thanks, Mark. And so now, um... In less slides, uh, I will I will share a little bit about what's happening at the University of Washington. And this is research, but I'm also going to talk about training because as a university, this is where we can work best with um, with industry and and, and um, national lab partners. So next slide. Great. So um, to find out more about what's happening at University of Washington research-wise, um, you can go to the, the URL that's on this page, which is updated about, you know, a couple times a year uh, where you can see all the different projects. And QIS research at the University of Washington is conducted across several departments and actually two colleges, uh, College of Engineering and College of Arts and Sciences. And on this Whoa! Oh, on this website, um, it's 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 categorized uh, around algorithms, hardware and systems, sensors, and matter and materials. All right, next next slide. So I just I, I picked just a few projects from uh, from QuantumX that that's highlighted on the website to give you an idea of kind of the breadth of what's happening in in academia and at the University of Washington. Um, at this time. And actually in the previous slide, you may have noticed there was a purple color laser. That was actually a laser from my lab working with defects in zinc oxide. It's actually the same color as what you see in the upper left-hand corner of this two-dimensional trapped ion crystals. So, so many people may know that trapped ions are one of the leading technology platforms um, for quantum computing. And in fact, Microsoft is working with, with Honeywell and INQ as a, a quantum computing platform. Um, and so at the University of Washington, uh, most of those, those, those traps are linear traps, but Boris Blinoff, for example, is working in two-dimensional traps, which allows you to uh, have, have more connectivity and increased number of qubits available for quantum logic operations. Um, in a similar vein, we have efforts in cold atoms 
in molecules uh, in the lab of Deep Gupta, um, working at um, understanding condensed phases of matter like superfluids, for example. Um, and then we have a, a couple of very forward thinking efforts, um, which is how can we utilize quantum information processing to understand physics. Um, in particle physics, uh, there's an effort on understanding if and how quantum machine learning can help uh, uh, looking at um, extremely rare events on large backgrounds, such as the Higgs boson. And there's actually the start of a five-year program um, uh, at, in the physics department, which is learning how quantum simulation uh, and quantum algorithms can be applied uh, to understanding quantum field theory and quantum many-body systems. So both using physics as physical platforms, but then also trying to understand how you can use quantum resources to understand complex physical systems. Next slide. Okay, um, we also uh, have work uh, in materials for, for quantum information and uh, there is an effort on developing um, topological platforms um, or topologically protected platforms, similar to what, what Mark just talked about, but using two-dimensional materials, which is a major research effort at UW. Um, there's uh, an effort in synthesizing um, the type of defects I look at. I look at these defects in single crystal diamond, but we have an effort on campus um, to look at these defects in tiny nano diamonds that could be brought very, very close to whatever they're trying to sense, actually creating them. Um, and then on the, on the right-hand side, um, there's a theoretical effort in understanding coherence, being able to model coherence on classical, classical computers, which we know um, are not the ideal system, but still with um, ab initio theory, we, we do need, is what we have, is our workhorse right now. And, and hopefully we can use it to understand materials that then can be used to realize quantum processing platforms. And then a, a larger effort at the bottom, which is trying to close the link between uh, theoret theoretically calculating the properties of, of materials, looking at the emergent quantum behavior in the material, um, and then uh, looking at the structure of the material, like knowing where every single atom is in that material and trying to accelerate material acceleration or materials discovery um, via this three prong approach. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, in particular in electrical engineering, we have a lot of uh, devices and we're very much interested in, in photons and phonons and things that could be uh, considered quantum buses. Um, we are looking, uh, Arkham Agemdor is looking at uh, coupling many, many uh, nonlinear single, at nonlinear to single photon level cavities for, for understanding uh, uh, entanglement. Um, I'm working uh, with, uh, on an effort of, of quantum networks on one side that are on a single chip, but then with, with collaborators at UW and Princeton and Duke at, how do you efficiently go from a, a single spin uh, that can store information, and this is with the Nitrogen Vacancy Center in Diamond, to a single photon that's at 1550 nanometers that can be then transmitted along a fiber. So this is this quantum transduction concept. And then Mo Li uh, is doing very similar things, uh, but with acoustics, working at how, how acoustics or phonons and single phonons can interact uh, with defects and serve as a phononic bus. Uh, additionally, um, there is, uh, he has a project with Arkham Ajumdar and Cal Boringer on, on using acoustics to um, steer and trap very, very large uh, a cold atom lattices. And this is this is in collaboration with, with, um, with uh, atom computing. So next slide. So that's just a taste of all the different types of projects that are going on. And of course, in each of our labs, there are, are many graduate students that are working on this. Um, there is a nice uh, video that was produced by Microsoft that came um, and looked at, you know, why we need a, a more educated workforce. And so this is a nice um, 
snapshot, you can look up quantum impact and education. And in it, it also, you know, you can see highlights from our nanofabrication facility, which is open to, to companies uh, that can come work on it and where almost all of the devices working in quantum information research that's, that are being um, studied on campus are, are built in our fabrication facility. And you can also see uh, Chris Sesori from Microsoft talking to a couple of students in our laboratories, in this case, Boris Blinoff's lab, um, and also, also my lab. Next slide. So one thing that we're really excited about is that um, we just got funded this fall for an NSF National Research Traineeship Program. And so as, as Mark said, there's this pipeline for people um, that maybe aren't, aren't in academia or aren't coming out um, with PhDs. And so this is a 12 to 15 month graduate certificate program. So it's not a, an undergraduate program yet uh, at this point. Um, but it is for masters and PhD students where uh, after talking, uh, there was a, a workshop that I was part of on, on workforce development and talking to many companies. Uh, what companies were saying is they don't, they don't necessarily want someone that's just a, an expert in quantum information. They want someone that has a very solid foundation in, um, for example, um, quantum chemistry that knows quantum information or in electrical and computer engineering or computer science that knows quantum information. And so based on this feedback of, of what, of what Nisri was looking at, we designed this program where you still get your degree, your master's degree or your PhD in one of the core disciplines, but you have this extra 12 to 15 month certificate where you take um, an onboarding class that's under the, the learn part which is designed to be catered to the language that you're used to speaking from your undergraduate. Um, then you do a, a, a learn and practice course where you have larger base problems of implementing and um, algorithms and tasks on one of the cloud-based computers uh, with our partners IBM or, or later on with Microsoft. Um, um, in this case, we're really interested in understanding the limitations so everyone can understand the limitations as we seek to have um, software, software engineers and, and people developing algorithms at now still have to understand the hardware that's involved in practical implementations. And the material scientists also need to understand the properties of the materials that will accelerate and enhance the performance of the types of gates that exist today in, in, in commercial systems. Um, and then there's a advanced course and also a, an internship and in capstone uh, with our with our industry partners that goes into this program. So we're excited. Um, if you know people that are interested in this, uh, we'll have something out on our QuantumX website over the next few weeks on how you can apply to this program. Um, but this is an example of trying one university and many universities are trying to do this, but trying to fill this this need for workforce development in this area. Next, next slide. And then because of this, the University of Washington is also expanding its faculty. And so uh, there is a cluster higher in College of Engineering, as Nathan said at the introduction, he, not everyone who's going to be in quantum information is going to be coming from physics, right? There is a huge uh, range of skill sets that are needed um, in this area. And so um, the College of Engineering announced a, a cluster hire. And so there'll be four to six uh, new faculty over the next two to three years in electrical and computer engineering, computer science and engineering, material science and engineering, and mechanical engineering. And there are faculty searches this year, even um, with the, the financial limitations. This is such an important area. There are searches this year in ECE, ME, and CSE. So with that, I'll pass the baton uh, to Nathan. Okay, it was right when my dog started barking too. So thanks, Kaimi. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, wrap things up here with uh, a quick overview of um, some of the quantum information sciences research going on at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. And then um, just uh, uh, two final slides on how to get involved and, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, so Mark, next slide. Okay, so um, I've broken this into two pieces um, because I think a lot of organizations and certainly the Department of Energy National Labs um, have been asking, how do we get started in quantum? 
Now, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab has a long history in many areas that are absolutely not quantum. But if, if you take anything away from this uh, presentation today, I think it's, it's the realization that most organizations have gotten to that they, they need to figure out how to pivot into quantum. And that's aided by the fact that there are so many needs at so many different levels of the stack in, um, in quantum. And that's, that's sort of how PNNL fits in. So um, Department of Energy has stewarded a, a variety of, of capabilities at, at PNNL, and many of which are, are relevant to quantum, but there's three that really stand out and define how PNNL is getting engaged in, in quantum and, and at the direction of uh, DOE sort of pivoting to uh, apply these capabilities in that space. So the first is computing and simulation. Um, we have a long history of uh, work in scalable algorithms for a variety of areas, but um, in particular in the physical uh, sciences, looking at chemistry and material systems and understanding how to make those algorithms work on very novel architectures, not just the traditional sort of, you know, one processor rules them all, um, old fashioned model of computing, but more and more heterogeneous environments with very different memory models, coprocessors and communication struggles that need to be adapted uh, to, in order to make uh, the, the problem in quantum chemistry or materials run as efficiently as possible. And you'll see that as a building block on the next slide to, to how we're tackling problems in quantum commute computing in particular applications in quantum computing. Thanks to uh, Department of Energy as well, um, PNNL has a long standing uh, set of expertise in both preparing, uh, so growing, as well as characterizing materials and many uh, for many different aspects. So some of the materials are directly re relevant to quantum computing systems and to 3.5 uh, materials, but there's other aspects, particularly focused on the post-processing of materials. So understanding how to clean a material. This is a picture of resonators here in the middle. Um, that the, the growth of the material might be perfect, but if it's post-processing is, is um, damaging to the substrate, then it's, uh, it's actually not a particularly good material. So uh, whether it's growing, whether it's uh, characterizing, or whether it's um, understanding how to uh, use these materials um, in, in a way that, that preserves their integrity, that's, that's another area of long investment and, and deep capabilities at the lab. And then uh, last but certainly not least is um, understanding, sensing, and environmental control. And this comes from PNNL's missions, both in national security and in high energy and nuclear physics. Um, so there's, there's very similar problems in understanding very, very low levels, for example, of radiation or um, other, other observables for nuclear processes that map over to um, understanding uh, very, very low probability events in nuclear and high energy physics. And some of the sensors that you need for those types of problems actually uh, are, are very similar or sometimes the same between those two very different problem spaces. And we'll see on the next slide how that maps over to, um, to quantum information sciences. So Mark, if you could advance the slide. Okay, so what are we doing in quantum? And uh, like Kaime or like Mark, it's, it's impossible to summarize everything the organization is doing in quantum um, in the remaining few minutes we have left here. Uh, so I wanna hit highlights and uh, I'm really happy to talk if you have any questions or, or wanna know the details. Um, that could be with some of the cases, I'll just pass you along to the expert rather than trying to dig up the details here myself. But you can kind of break uh, our current activities into four bins. The first bin, grows directly from our expertise in applications and computing, particularly as it applies to problems in quantum chemistry and materials. And this is understanding how to take the knowledge of making quantum chemistry calculations run very well on very complicated uh, classical architectures and applying that to understand how to tackle similar problems using quantum architectures. So PNNL has a software package that's developed here and with, with numerous partners called NWCAM or Northwest CAM. And Northwest CAM has been the focus of uh, a lot of work jointly between Microsoft and PNNL, trying to understand how to integrate that, uh, the core algorithms into uh, and make them work on, on quantum architectures. And in particular, building a bridge between uh, the classical processing that will always need to happen on classical hardware and taking the core, the most expensive uh, computations and moving them over to quantum systems. And that sort of uh, 
moves nicely into the second bin here, which is uh, you may have a, a great kind of concept of how it is to divide up the the physics or the science of your system into parts that map to classical systems and parts that map to quantum systems. But actually applying those um, requires rendering that decomposition into an algorithm and then implementing that algorithm in a quantum programming uh, language. And so we have uh, several different activities going on in very basic uh, algorithm development, uh, as well as a, a much more applied activity um, in collaboration with Microsoft uh, looking at how to uh, develop good programming models for implementing uh, problems in basic sciences onto quantum architectures through the Microsoft Q Sharp framework. The last two bins are very different um, and it focuses on a lower level of the stack. So the first is, is taking our expertise in, in growing and characterizing materials and starting to look at material systems that are relevant to, to quantum processors. And so this uh, this is a picture here of um, some electron, uh, actually it was a multimodal uh, characterization of uh, understanding the structures associated with a, with a quantum device um, from uh, actually from one of the Microsoft labs. Um, and that, uh, as I mentioned, it builds not only on the ability to grow these, but to understand uh, the heterogeneity, both in terms of composition and the structure of what it is that you've grown and then mapping the, the perfections or imperfections uh, over into the actual performance of the system. The last bin here grows directly from the, uh, the, the sensing and environmental control uh, expertise that is so important to uh, national security and high energy physics missions. And um, you can think of this uh, bin as, as sort of uh, in terms of the bad joke, which I didn't come up with. That there's no such thing as a bad qubit, it's just a really good sensor. And in this case, trying to understand what a qubit is seeing around it and how to either turn that into useful sensing measurements that can be applied to some of these uh, ultra sensitive uh, uh, areas of you know, either nuclear um, detection or high energy physics, but also understanding what the mechanisms are by which the environment interacts with, with a qubit. And so this picture here is from a recent uh, nature paper that was uh, a variety of contributors, PNNL, MIT, many others trying to understand how does radiation uh, interact with superconducting qubits? And how does that get translated into most likely quasi-particles that change the behavior of that system? That opens doors for uh, the basic physics of understanding those effects, but also for harnessing those effects and making better sensors, as well as mitigating those effects to make better quantum um, devices. So uh, next slide, please. Ooh. And I had an animation. So um, this slide uh, just dives in a little bit more deeply to uh, some of the work that's going on uh, specifically in quantum chemistry. Quantum chemistry is one of the flagship uh, areas of, of PNNL's computational and uh, basic sciences efforts. And this is a highly cartoonized uh, version of how it is that we're taking uh, sort of existing classical representations of quantum chemistry as they're found in NW Chem and building interfaces and also streamlining algorithms that get implemented through Q-Sharp uh, in partnership with Microsoft. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into uh, the details, but there's publications as well as people who'd be very happy to talk to you at great length about um, the, the details of, of this work. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, and this is just uh, additional um, information. This is a picture from the last summit, as well as some of the, the collaborators at Microsoft working on this, uh, this, this problem. Uh, I think the next slide should be some of the, the wrap-up slides for, for the presentation. Right, okay. So um, the, the Northwest Quantum Nexus is, is very much intended to be a consortium. You could think of the three uh, keystone members as, as hopefully the, uh, the entities that nucleate the transition to a much, much bigger enterprise. Um, you've seen several logos from the Northwest uh, throughout the course of this presentation, uh, both in, in Microsoft, at uh, the UBC partnerships, at, um, at University of Washington. We really do want this thing to grow and to grow, we need engagement. Um, in a perfect world, it would be COVID free engagement and we, we would have had many of the activities that we wanted to start well underway. Um, unfortunately, like everyone, we've had to reinvent some of what it means to have a, a, a normal Northwest quantum nexus. But there are still ways to get engaged. And we would not only be interested in having your participation, but also your ideas. Um, as members of the Northwest quantum community, 
what do you want to see? What would be most valuable to you? And how can we use this, uh, this nexus to, to make those things happen? So um, the ongoing activity that I mentioned at the start is the seminar series. The next uh, instantiation of that is on October 19th uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, feel free to uh, drop me a note or check out the uh, nwquantum.com website uh, to get more information about that uh, event. Um, additionally, we're still trying to figure out the right uh, socially distanced way to have workshops. Um, that are more than just, uh, you know, ongoing uh, video calls, but to actually making them meaningful in terms of building collaborations and learning about each other's uh, research. Um, we would like to reinvent uh, the, the hackathon in, a, I guess, a virtual way. Um, we've had a couple of uh, very successful hackathons uh, so far at the different uh, uh, institutions. Of course, those were in-person pre-COVID. Um, we're looking for creative ways to reinvent those. Um, and, you know, when, when the time is right, we would like to uh, have yet another instance of our biannual summit, which may be less than biannual uh, coronavirus willing. In addition to that, um, I don't need to reiterate the, uh, the great examples of uh, workforce development activities of which uh, PNNL is, is a contributor, but are really being driven out of organizations like uh, University of Washington by Kaime and others. And if you're interested in learning more about those or you have ideas about getting involved or creating new activities, again, we'd love to hear from you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the upshot here is that um, this is, uh, the NQN is a start. Uh, we have uh, three keystone organizations that hopefully will seed the growth for uh, a much larger and um, uh, engaged activity that cuts across Cascadia Corridor and beyond. And so this last slide includes a link to the Northwest Quantum Nexus website, as well as our contact information if you'd like to learn more. Um, and I think that's it. So if, uh, if it's okay with Mark Jackson, we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Nathan, Kaime, and Mark. Uh, that was fantastic. And uh, yes, uh, thanks for the contact information so they can get in touch with you. Are there any questions? What about funding from the DOD? Do you, Kaime, do you want to talk about ARO or? Um... Oh, I mean, almost every DOD agency is funding. The MIRI project that I mentioned earlier is funded by ARO. Um, but I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think the DOD was mentioned in the NQI specifically, but there is certainly funding <laughs> funding in by the DOD, by every single AFOSR, um, ONR, ARO, um, IARPA, or they're all they're all funding in this area. Well, are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, uh, well, let me thank you again. That was that was great, and uh, I hope that that uh, some people get in touch with you, and that we can have events, virtual or in person. <laughs> yeah. Organizing this. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure thing. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Everyone.